Welcome to the Business of Social podcast powered by STN Digital. I'm David Brickley and on the Business of Social, we examine the digital advertising industry and analyze how brands successfully increase their ad revenue and brand affinity through cutting edge content on social. In short, we talk to the experts so you're able to keep your thumb on the pulse of the ever-changing landscape of social and digital media. I'm super excited about the guest who joins me in the studio today. She's a former on-air host and executive producer that led her to an Emmy back in 2011. She's a contributed writer to publications like Inc., Huffington Post, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, and Forbes, and she currently serves as the founder of BAM Communications, a public relations firm focused on representing the movers, shakers, breakers, and makers in technology. Beck, thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. So I want to start with how you started in the industry, going back mm -hmm. to uh, 06 when you started in TV. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually NBC back here in San yeah. Diego and that whole story. So I want to I want to start there. And and it even starts earlier than that because that was when I had just come back from to San Diego from doing my MBA out in Pittsburgh. And by that point, I had had I think four or five internships at KQED, which was who so the produced... NBA was in journalism or in the... no 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 it no? was it was well and the story to that is I went to UCLA I did a very fast undergrad two years I was wow. nineteen and I was in that last year at UCLA and I thought well okay I can graduate in these two years how did you do that and, by the way is that just so twenty eight units a semester <laughs> you had to yes you had to yeah. take a lot of units I came in with a lot of AP credits hmm. I very strategically picked the courses. The, the course flow of the courses because a lot of times you miss something, you yeah. miss one of the classes, then you're bumped up, you know, bump, yep. bumped back a lot of times. Yep. So, no, I had it mapped out and the economics degree was a shorter one. So I didn't need as many credits. Okay. I graduated with one extra credit. Wow. So by, by one. So anyway, the point was I was like this, I could have mapped out and which means in the summer that I was done after the first year, I thought I can go to MBA school, but that means I have to apply right now. Yeah. It was June when I'm thinking this. I'm going okay. Applications are due pretty much October. And, and, and 19 going for your master's is pretty. Yeah, pretty and that's. <laughs> I mean, it was either I'm going to be done. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was 18 when I was applying, so I'm going to be done with school, or I'm going to be probably one of the youngest graduates ever in one of these top, you know, 50 schools right. or something. So let's give it a shot. And if I get into the place, I'm going to go. And I got into University of Pittsburgh, so I went to Pittsburgh. That's awesome. So then, by that time, after coming back out of Pittsburgh, I had had a bunch of TV internships okay. and, and producing some stuff too where was a business show i worked on production stuff then i was like a show runner for a station that was here kusi yep. news which everyone yep. starts at and ends at it seems like is, is of course starts the, it ends. starts and ends there <laughs> everyone knows that and then got hired at nbc to be just the lowly 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 of producer one of those people that's working at 3 a.m mm -hmm. writing the scripts and stuff and then i always knew i wanted to do my own tv show highlighting and talking with business founders, business right. executives, like Ralph Rubio, he was one of my first guys Very on nice. the show. And so created that show, which then the CW and then a, a, the Fox affiliate here ran. And at one point I was going, I got introduced to a PR executive, a guy who had his own firm here in town. So back up one second, just because yeah. I'm interested. So you created that show, meaning the concept, Yeah, you were actually gonna host it? Yeah. Or, okay. And I, awesome. I, I mean, I called all the people. I called all the assistants to line up the, the thing. I mean, you, I did everything. And did, did they everything. have to approve budget at that point? Like when you have the concept, like are you producing it and saying just put it on your air type deal? Or? Yes. Okay. So I was, I happily was able to meet a production company here also locally that said, we'll do this. We'll shoot it, yeah. Yeah, we'll shoot it. And it was great. I mean, their team was fantastic. And with their team of 10 or so, they cut it, they shot awesome. it. I mean, it was the whole gamut. And, and cut it for TV. So Fox yes, is like, let's, let's roll yes. it. Gotcha. I mean, it was just a great, great thing. That's so awesome. I got introduced to then this PR guy here in town to be the co-host of one of the shows or one of the seasons. Didn't work out with him, which is a good thing. Okay. But while I was putting on one of the shows together in his office, because I would sit in his office, you know, doing calling the assistants mm -hmm. to book these CEOs and stuff. I was around the PR team yeah. that he had. And via just osmosis, I thought, oh, I could do this PR thing too. <laughs> like I, it's one of those stupid things you think of as just the entrepreneur of like, I think I could do this. Yeah, yeah I have no background, but yeah. who cares? So you just figure it out. And so then I started 
BAM, which is now BAM today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have one client to start with and right. you have two little dorky clients and then you eventually have four and then you need to hire people. And, and here we are today. So was that when you started the company, BAM, was that something like, let me just try this and maybe it won't work out and I'll go do yeah. another show. It wasn't exactly. really. Exactly. Okay. It was kind of like, oh, I could do this. It's about t storytelling. I love storytelling. It's about writing. I love to write. I'm already in media. So yeah, why not? Let's give it a whirl. And in the Emmy in 2011, they had to do with yeah. that that show. That as well? was one of the yeah, it was a that's show. awesome. It's cool. so cool. Um, so yeah, I wanted to jump into that story because I think your background in TV and then leading in the PR, I think, um, is, is super beneficial to this conversation. Mm -hmm. So you you talked about what led you in the PR, but give me your elevator pitch on BAM Communications and what you do with your clients day to day. Yep, we're storytellers, okay, and we're storytellers mostly for them. So. Our whole notion is everyone has a story mm -hmm. and it is our job to elevate and showcase that story. Now, some companies more than others have better stories yeah. than others. So we have to be a bit discriminate, just like our venture capitalist partners that we work mm -hmm. with, in whom are we going to work with because the story is so good and juicy. Our favorite situation is when we have a company that is very stealth, hasn't been exposed, is doing something absolutely groundbreaking and w possibly world changing that we then get to collaborate with and expose in the media. So when our clients are working with us and we like to say they're barrier breaking brands, we are here fundamentally to showcase that story via getting them mostly in editorial earned content. Gotcha. So that's getting in the Bloombergs or yep. the CNBCs and the tech crunches of the world. Number two, that could be in their content. Mm -hmm. So writing content, placing that content, byline content. Number three, it could be in their social channels. So how we tell that story and, and just keeping the whole storyline together. The narrative, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the narrative tight mm -hmm. and consistent is fundamentally what we do. So with your clients, a lot of these are some of those big tech companies that yeah. have um, injects of Series A funding, things like that. What's usually the core demographic? Uh, I'm sure it's different company to company, but are you trying to get in specific publications for more funding potentially to be in that space or what's mm -hmm. your main, main demographic? That is one of the primary drivers. Okay. Usually if you're fundraising, there's the term called just you're always, always be front funded. Because if you get in front of the 40 year old mom in Wisconsin, that's not necessarily help. I mean, uh, yeah. If you're a B2C company, right. that's trying to target that person. So, a lot of the B2B companies we work with, they don't want to be in a good housekeeping a or niche, a men's health or Today yeah. Show because their clients are, let's say, Fortune 100, Fortune 1000 data companies There's that a are oriented. There's a few that you need to get There's in front certain of. Yeah. niche things. So mostly because we're working with all tech startups, all of the national business tech press, whether it be a TechCrunch to a VentureBeat to a Bloomberg to a, a CNBC, mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they all want to be in those. Yep. That That's pretty much the foundation. Yep. Then there may be some certain nicher outlets that they want to be in, whether it be trade outlets. So let's say they're in ag tech. There's a lot of art, ag, agri, um, agricultural publications right. that yep. fit for that. Or they could be a B2C type of client, which makes sense that they're targeting, okay, women from 18 years yeah. old to 35. Okay, what are those outlets that are read by those women in urban cities in the US? Okay, well, there's a handful of those outlets that we should also target. I'm I'm jumping ahead here, but I've always been interested in, in the PR world about, I guess, overextending your welcome in a way. I mean, when you have these mm. connections with the Today Show, you mm -hmm. have the connection with some of these tech blogs, especially niche, and you represent um, nine clients that are trying to get into the yeah. same. How do you balance that? Because I'm, I'm sure if someone does you a favor one time, maybe you have to kind of let it let it chill there this for a while. This is why PR is one of the most stressful jobs in America. I mean, the more it clients you get, the harder. On yeah that list of what are the most stressful jobs, you know, construction work or police, mm -hmm. PR is on there. And you go, what the hell? You know, yeah. we're not, and it's one of the gals in our office likes to say, it's it's PR, not ER. You know, we are not dealing with people possibly dying on tables and yeah. such that are, that are critical things, but- It's 24 seven too. 24 mm seven -hmm. and you're dealing with, and the media is 24 seven, but you are dealing with pleasing the client and pleasing the press and being the bridge between those. Yeah. And the press owe you nothing. So the only way What's to get their me, trust, right? exactly. Yeah. The only way to get their trust is you need to be the friend of them, help them get their sources, help them produce the story, and not always be just funneling and pushing your clients for obviously your benefit. They yeah. know what the deal is. Exactly. And this is why there's a lot of tension between these two entities, the publicist versus the journalist, mm -hmm. because bad publicists will just spray you forever with all their crap clients, let's say, if you're dealing with such a company. Yep. And then they're gonna ignore you and say, you know, you're not you're not getting giving me anything of I value. Think, yeah, I think um, that's interesting. One thing that I think there's a 
common misconception that I'm sure you hear and you probably have a, a good take on this is the difference between PR and advertising. Oh, yes. Um, and even marketing. There's three pillars there, right? That mm -hmm. I think everybody just kind of jumbles up. Yeah, yeah. But you being in the space, I think your take on this would be interesting to explain that difference between PR mm -hmm. and advertising. Mm -hmm. So PR, typically, mm -hmm. and we should clarify this too, public relations can mean many, many, many different things of all the publics you were speaking to. Maybe that's your board. Maybe that's your yeah. shareholders. It could be your employees, your internal communications. Yeah, memos, right? It can be influencers in Washington and such. Maybe it's it's government affair type of thing. So there can be all types of mm -hmm. relations that you have to manage. So the, so the umbrella of public relations is quite large. Typically what people think of is more what's really media relations, yeah. which is, oh, how do you deal with the press? How do you get in the press and so forth? So we, we say we're a PR firm, but really it's a communications firm that we or media relations of what we do so if you're in media relations and what is the value then of the articles and the yeah. news pieces you get versus advertising it's long been known and there's many different people who debate this but that editorial earned content is far more valuable yeah. and credible than anything you could buy for an ad because the consumer they know. is savvy enough mm -hmm. to know, oh, that's a paid spot. And that's why you have to disclose it in magazines. You know, this is an advertisement, this is an advertisement. Because it, it, you can say whatever you want in an advertisement. You can write a check yeah. right now to the Wall Street Journal and you could be in that paper on Monday. It's true. Absolutely. It's going to be a big check, but absolutely. Yep. You want to get a whole story feature that's about your company and all the cool stuff you're doing? Okay, that's much harder. Yeah. And that that's going to be much more validating. Yes. So... PR, I, the way I, I see it, and I was ignorant of this at one point too, is the, the PR standpoint is the earned media or coming from credible sources yes. talking about your brand in a somewhat organic way, right? Correct. Advertising is you're literally paying to say the iHeartRadio Awards are on TBS on yeah. March 11th. Mm -hmm. Pay for play. You pay for play. Yep. Um, so I want to inject social media into this because mm -hmm. I'm sure it's changed your world dramatically, especially mm -hmm. in the last five years. So if you don't mind talking about the transition of maybe how you used to work the the, 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 the first year you started band communications oh, yeah. and then where we are today in 2018, mm -hmm. um, we saw everything that happened with the election and Facebook and oh, everything yeah. like that. But um, in your industry specifically, how have you kind of managed that? Mm -hmm. Depends what space the client is in. If they're in something super technical, mm -hmm. B2B, you know, they don't need to have be on Instagram necessarily, or they don't need to have a super active Facebook. Very different for B2C. But what we do know at this point is you cannot ignore your social channels. Right. It is another outlet that you control. Yep. So it's owned content that you can control on that. And you should leverage it to the best of your ability when you have a great piece of earned content come out. Right. So that should be shared. That should be exposed. We have a technology that lets us see what is the social amplification of every piece of coverage we get. So now we get to see, oh, how is it shared? Where does it go? Because it might be, let's say, a smaller publication or a smaller media piece, but then actually on the social channels, it's robustly shared within right. your communities and such. So the long and short of it is you cannot ignore all the social channels. Why would you also given that it's another it's a it's a, it's a free yeah. it's a free billboard. way yeah. a billboard yeah. for you to do it you just need to do it well and you need to make it sure it's consistent and appropriate for your business I want to dig into the data part of it because I think old school PR is if you get into a magazine, earn media wise, it's circulation times three. Yeah, because no, if I, no, no. <laughs> but that, if I get the magazine, I'm going to share it with my girlfriend and share it mm -hmm. with my friend, which is, and listen, we talked it before the show, Nielsen ratings isn't really uh, yeah. an exact science. There's yeah. really no black and white as we stand here today. But what data tools have you used to show mm -hmm. the client, here's the value of that Forbes mm -hmm. article or here's the value of that influencer talking about your mm -hmm. brand? So there are now... In, and there's a variety of them, tools and robust data analytic tools that any firm can buy, okay. any company can buy, mm -hmm. usually for a pretty penny, t truly, but that can show you as much as feasible right now right. online what a piece of coverage does, what the influencers are saying and so forth. So we use one that we white label. It's called Trendkite. It's okay. very popular. It's expensive though. So is one of our clients necessarily going to buy that for 20 grand to have a year long subscription? Probably not. So if it's something that we can offer our clients, which we do, then that's a value to them. But gotcha. what it allows you to see is how is your share of voice? How does you how do or how are your press pieces stacking up compared to competitors? Mm. What is the social amplification? So where is it going? This piece of coverage, and such of all the places placements you got, what was the most driving to your website? Where did people click? Interesting. Where did it go? 
However, that all being said, do we ever fully know the extent Clear of which? ROI? No. No, you just don't. <laughs> yeah. This is the oldest problem in advertising and marketing today because we cannot at this point track where did the influence of those eyeballs on the Coca-Cola billboard in the stadium that you exactly. saw yeah. go. Who knows? And, and we I, do not know. And I say that all the time. You know, you have a billboard on the 405 freeway next mm -hmm. to LAX, and they say, you know, 1.3 million people drive by this billboard. Yeah. But how many people actually see it? How many people write down the phone number to the law firm? And yes. then how many people actually call because they saw the bill? And all you yeah. can really do now is, hey, so how'd you hear about us? Um, but well, even and the thing is, too, awareness, yes, is yep. the first step. But awareness does not necessarily to, mean anything yeah. else. So, for example, obviously I'm aware of Pepsi. Mm -hmm. Do I drink Pepsi? No. No, I don't. I'm aware of ESPN. Do I listen to ESPN, yeah. watch ESPN? No, I do not. Yep. So awareness is just the first, first little step in order for a whole conversion to, let's say, happen. I think one thing we saw in the last year was the Wendy's tweet. So we, yeah. we remember Carter Wilkerson. He said, hey, Wendy's, how, how many retweets do I need to get free chicken nuggets for a year? And they re a great social media uh, uh, report. They ace it. They do it. Do well, uh, but good for them for replying them and saying 18 million. If you get 18 million retweets, we're going to give it to you. And of course, he ends up only getting three point, I think it was six million. Yeah. Um, but it was the number one retweeted tweet in Twitter history. It beat Ellen, the selfie, I think a lot of people remember yeah. from the Oscars, Oscars. or Emmys. Um, that's an interesting thing there too, though, because you're talking about it since Twitter's history from 06, we're talking about 12 years no tweet has ever been shared more than this tweet mm -hmm. for Wendy's. They got an amazing amount of press. Mm -hmm. Did they sell more hamburgers that quarter is the question. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. they, I, I haven't looked into it. Maybe We'd they did. We'd have to look into it. But that's something where potentially they didn't. Potent but how amazing is that for the brand and how mm -hmm. much does that help? And that's mm -hmm. the age old question I think you talk about. That is the oldest question we have here. It is. Yeah. And it's, we may never know. The only way we would know, I think, is if, there's some radical technology, which would be very scary, mm -hmm. to track inside your brain <laughs> yeah, exactly. what you're thinking of, what makes you go and buy some type of thing. Because just like in advertising where they talk about it's multiple, multiple, multiple exposures, it typically is before yeah. you then take an action. Yep. Sometimes not. Sometimes you click it right away. You, you need buy a couple it, of touches. In but yeah. sometimes there is. So it's just a, it's more, it's an art still. I do think we're getting closer though, because when it comes to, I mean, even Facebook advertisement, you oh, can yeah. actually target the 18 to 35 year old mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. You can see how many clicks are going to your website. Mm -hmm. Facebook actually has a, an algorithm that will only charge you based on checkouts or based on it's, traffic. It's true. So we're getting closer there because now we used to have that magazine or that newspaper mm -hmm. and we're hoping it works, mm -hmm. but now you're actually gonna be able to track people where they're clicking mm -hmm. and where they're going, especially mm -hmm. with their mobile devices. So. And Facebook is killing it on that yeah. in terms of their revenue. So that's very smart for them to do such a process yes. of the click to your cart in order for you to be charged. So as we, impression, no one cares about that. I, no one cares about that I at know. this point. No CMO, no another, marketers, another great, like impression, we don't care. Another great number is potential reach. Oh, I, I, <laughs> what is that? That's billions. Potential, usually. yeah, it's billions. Yeah. It's the whole planet, yeah. Yeah. okay? More than the planet usually. Uh, um, but as we dig in here, how can brands, in your opinion, I mean, this is kind of overall, and this is a loaded question I know, but how can they use social media to uh, you know, increase their PR efforts or their brand awareness oh, yes. in, in the right way, in your opinion? So the number one thing, and this is what we grill our clients on, or we're doing the social, so we're helping them with this, right. is when you do get that earned piece, that you share it and you leverage it to the best of your ability okay. on all your platforms. Mm -hmm. If you look at Facebook, you see a lot of brands do this. Mm -hmm. They don't say, oh, just buy our thing. They put where the press has said, this is the best new gadget of 2018. Because yes. that these builds the, a credibility. These are the softest about. sheets ever from L Magazine. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Because that's credibility and that's yep. validation. And that is what the media still functions as, is a, is a validation tool and a signal to the consumer. So that's the number one thing, is use those earned pieces. Don't let them slide into the abyss of just never being mentioned. Because you should be using that not only in your advertising, but just generally when you get the piece. Get that out there. And then secondly, you could put it in your sales decks or whatever else is helpful on your website and such. But that's the number one thing is like, do not cut yourself off of getting a great piece of coverage right. and then not leveraging it immediately and continuously on your platforms. 
And do you recommend boosting those posts and putting paid behind it anytime you get that earned media? Because the more eyeballs that see yes. that credibility, it will help yes. your brand? Okay. Yes. Typically, that's going to be a yes. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's the number one thing. So how big, uh, in your opinion, are influencers? Maybe not specifically in your space, but mm-hmm. we've seen this. I mean, when I was a kid, it was Michael Jordan. And I wanted I, I wanted my mom to buy me Wheaties and buy me Hanes underwear and everything that he, mm-hmm. that he really said, I like this or this is my brand. But now with social media, there's these tech bloggers, there's mm-hmm. these um, mommy bloggers, if yeah. you will, that can really take your product to the next level by just mentioning it. And I'm wondering if you've dealt with or how you've brought in social media influencers mm-hmm. to extend that brand awareness or message. So the whole influencer space is is in a little bit of an upheaval, mm-hmm. I think, currently, because there is so much, so much supply of these individuals. It's because anybody can do it yeah. if you get to a good enough mark. Yep. Also, though, with the whole, and there were so, there was a great article in the New York Times about this, an investigative piece about b- paid or, or bought followers and even bots, bots. that we are about this on the show. that yeah. are mimicking real actual profiles. So they're calling it social theft yep. because your image, your dog's face, and yep. so forth are being stolen to look real and then be shown as following certain brands and stuff. So so the space is not highly regulated, yep. number one. And number two, there's just such a volume. So it's hard to distinguish and discern among the the credible ones who could actually do something for your brand and then the ones that are just yeah. fluff and fodder and really not real. Yeah. So one thing I always look at is, okay, you have 50,000 followers on your Instagram. Great. Okay. Of those, when you posted something, did you get 100 comments? Did yeah, you get exactly. a few hundred? Or did you get two? Yep. Because then that seems like a red flag right and there. And there's a problem even with that uh, because with the bots, bots can leave fake comments. and they, say, Then now we have that problem. That's yes. a problem too, right? That's um, a problem too. And I think, so with your clients in terms of ROI, because I think influencer, you made a great point. We don't know enough about it, but it's a sexy new thing, eh. especially like six months ago or a year ago, at least in, in, in our space when it comes to entertainment yeah. and sports. Everybody wants the Kendall Jenner to share yes. something, and she's that's a million bucks. Gonna yeah, cost that, you that. that's going to be a million. But yeah. I mean, there's people that have those two hundred thousand followers mm-hmm. that they want to be a part of. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, we've we've heard from our clients too. There's real no justification or ROI. They just want to play in the space. Yeah, and I'm and I'm wondering how you navigate that because I'm sure a lot of your clients say, well, let's do this on Snapchat, and you're like, whoa, 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 we can do that, but it's not really going to yeah. do what your end goal is. Yeah. We usually take it as a, it's a nice to have thing. If you have some extra budget you can dedicate to this and we want to experiment in that space, Mm -hmm. great. Should your entire marketing or majority budget be spent on just influencers? Probably risque. Probably risque just because of that supply and just the the craziness of of the, 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 the ecosystem of influencers. So we like to say, let's like, let's dedicate some to kind of experimenting. Some hopefully will be wonderful and a great, and it really do have those real followers and know their niche audience that could actually move your product, let's say. And then some are probably going to be a dud. And if you're okay with that, then okay. If you're not, if you're looking for a hit rate of like, we're going to do this hundred influencers and a hundred out of a hundred are going to be, you know, able to move X amount of product or whatever. No, no, that those are unrealistic expectations. So do you currently even recommend that with your current clients? I mean, not, obviously you're more not in the, for the Yeah, not for the B2B ones. They, they're, they're, no, not, not so much there. There's other influencers, let's say some bloggers and such, okay. that might be, of course, influential. But they're not like sitting back on, well, pay me $5,000 and, I'll, but and it, I'll talk about your sexy SaaS platform. Is there any, I mean, when you talk about trying to get in front of a niche market like a VC, is there mm-hmm. any... I guess basis behind you know these these people are on Facebook they are yeah. on Instagram let's say they follow Tim Ferriss because he's up in San Francisco and he talks to the business people mm-hmm. um, would it then be valuable or does it earn that credibility if he somehow can talk about that or maybe that's the, the do you try to get stuff in front of certain people that may share it organically or have that yes. media value okay yes that's always the best if yep. it could be an organic thing because a lot of times with any influencers oh. or even celebrities. They just love something. Yeah. And they're just excited about it and they will share Talk that. About it. That's that's the cool thing. The problem then on the other side is when we know you've been paid to disclose this. And now the FCC is involved with you needing to mention that this is a yes. paid thing. They crack down on the Kardashians mm-hmm. where they're number one target because do you really love that 
mascara oh, get or you get yeah. paid yeah. how much million million to really say that and the consumer gets pissed i think with that so if you can get the organic stuff if you have a tight list of real stuff that you could or or tight list of those influencers where you could drop it and see who really takes to it okay great maybe you can get something organic that's going to cost you pretty much nothing so why not start with that so in, in a situation where you're, let's say you're um, you're doing PR for a product like Mophie, which is a iPhone charger case or yeah. something like that, um, and you wanted to get in with the, with the influencers, like have you ever dealt with that before, where you're actually trying to send product and hoping they share? Because again, it's that it's that weird gray area where you mm -hmm. can't tell them they have to post, mm -hmm. but you're hoping that they do you this favor by mm -hmm. you doing that favor. So mm -hmm. how do you navigate those relationships? We usually don't do that. Yeah, because influencers only stream of revenue practically is being an influencer at this point. So they may come back and go like, I love this. Oh, well pay me the 5,000, 10,000 yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Cause they're not, they're not doing movies mm -hmm. or they're not doing, they're not doing a real job. A lot of times this is their one thing. Although some, you know, they're photographers or they're fitness people or whatever, but eh, yeah, you're going to probably get a response of, yeah, I love it, but here's the cost to kind of do that. So influencers are less, I think, influential in that space in terms of the organic play more important you can go with the actual media outlets so it is that they know they're getting pitched all the time yep. but they are not incentivized in any way True. to talk about something it to unless they love audience, it yeah. unless it works for what they're working on it's their focus it's their audience mm -hmm. they love it they think it's the best okay yep. then that's great and they weren't paid to yeah. do that that's so, still the best thing. So, so if what, I had a product, so if I had a little product, we right. don't usually have like little techie yeah, gadget products, right. but let's just say, theoretically, I wouldn't touch the influencers off the bat. I would go, hmm. what are the outlets in which this product could be showcased in? Great. Let's send a really cool, compelling gift boxed type of piece, or let's to set up a bunch- columnist To the columnist at Forbes? To, to the columnist or the person we're okay. trying to reach, although some of them can be a little bit, they, they don't like that. Or, or- Let's line up some meetings or let's have an event in which we could put it physically in their hand. That's interesting. Okay. Great. They could take it or not. And then they're going to be there and use it. So it's like, it's a soft pitch. It's not like, oh my gosh, you want to write about this, but hey, you're at our party. Here's our little swag. That's interesting. Take it home. Oh, you like it? Oh, you want some images now? Okay. So in your opinion, because I think it's interesting to get kind of more of an outsider take because I'm like in the middle of sports entertainment yeah. and social every single day. But from your standpoint, dealing in a somewhat different industry, what is your overall feeling on influencers and where we are five years from now? I, I don't think they're going away. But I'm, bearish. I'm bearish. I'm bearish. The the, there's a lot of people that fill, your, that fill, fill the same yes. way. Yeah. The reason is, is because there is so much BS out there. So what do we usually see? Like in the crypto space right now, yeah. you see a big balloon. Yeah. You see all this interest, all this interest. And then it'll it'll morph back into what's realistic. <clears throat> I think the same will happen with influencers. There's a lot of people who want to get in the game, but then really it's going to shrivel to more its true market. Right. Instead of an explosive market, which is a lot of fodder. And before we mentioned the Michael Jordan example, right <clears throat> now getting The Rock or Kevin Hart or Snoop mm -hmm. Dogg to talk about your product is still super valuable. We just had Snoop Dogg on yeah. a thing last night. Yeah, with yeah. our client. So that, that's uh, something that has always worked, I think, with, and that's more not so much influencers are hoping they share, but actually you're paying a celebrity to endorse your product, which is different. But they're just, they're just- But they are the original influencers. Exactly. This is like, this influencer thing is just this new term but slapped I, I on for But I think what changed that is the only way you can get um, the word out about Wheaties or Gatorade through Michael Jordan was to have a linear commercial True. back in the day. True. Now with social media, if Stephanie, the mommy blogger, has that same, she probably has more reach than- Yeah, she might. Bravo or HLN mm -hmm. or these different TV networks. Mm -hmm. So there's certain, I mean, Fox Sports 1 has a has a television show that gets 100,000 viewers per show. Mm -hmm. Well, there's people on Instagram that can get millions of exactly. impressions and views. So that was that weird thing that happened a few years ago where, wait a second, why don't we just go to mm -hmm. Stephanie, the mommy blogger, who gets more reach than that of mm -hmm. Bravo television for a commercial. But to your point, I think with the, it's at least going to go through an evolution and transition with the bots and try to crack down on yep. that. And I think people are getting, they're getting smart to it. It, it, it all seemed organic and fun um, in, in the beginning, but now it's starting to feel a little yeah. salesy and, and, and a little much. Yeah. It's like crypto. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the real stuff will shake out. Yeah. It, it, I think it always goes through that transition. So earn media value. This is something that our uh, company deals a lot with. And I think, you know, working with the award shows, we had a situation where Lady Gaga organically tweeted, um, watching this show, I love it. This is so amazing. 
Again. Cha-ching. Yes. <laughs> Cha-ching. However, in an analytical deck to talk about how the event went afterwards, mm -hmm. in your opinion, just how do you explain that? Because again, we're still in a situation where we're, we don't know how many people saw that tweet. And I do it all the time. I'm a big basketball fan. Yeah. And I'm on the couch and I'm scrolling through Instagram and there'll be a highlight of LeBron dunking. And I yeah. go, it's Tuesday. Oh yeah, it's NBA on TNT, and I flip the television on. Uh -huh. But you can't track that. Mm. Um, and 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 maybe this is the ultimate that, end all problem. Okay. We have no solution for this. Yep. And anyone who's like, we do, no BS, that, because we are not in, inside the minds of every human and understanding their psyche so and your, their buying decisions. With your we clients, just are not. I think you almost have to get. You have to understand the value of PR, or you don't. And there's no way because I mean, if someone doesn't understand it, I just find it difficult for you to be like, no, 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 no here's. Uh, yeah, we don't deal with that. Okay. Because if we're trying to convince on a consistent base, no, that's a bad client for us, frankly. Okay. It. Our clients are ones who come to us saying we need PR, we understand it, or we think we understand it. Here is why we believe we need it. What can you do for us? We don't go after people who are going, oh, no, we never have done PR. Oh, we hate PR. Oh, we think it's valueless. And we're trying to like chase them and convince them. Dead that we, we, don't, we don't even touch that. But do you need to attach a dollar value? There's a lot of people that are mm. all about ROI. So mm -hmm. Lady Gaga, it would cost you $900,000 for her to tweet organically about you. And we found a way for her to do it just because. Yeah. Is that a number you put on that report at the end of the month and say, we're doing our job from you a dollars and cents that. standpoint. You could use that because that is a simple one-time transaction. You're not counting what happened from that, but to have bought that, okay. However- Is that the number one thing to use though or is it-, is it You can use that, but the, okay. the other problem of that is we now know or we're assuming that that was completely organic versus a paid thing if it wasn't disclosed paid. So- there's usually more value associated with that. That's How much? Here's the other side of the coin of the discussion of like, well, 2X, 3X, 10X. Who knows? The problem yeah. is, but at least, at least you could say, hey, client, you know what? Had you had paid for that, we know her price, we know her price, pricing list. Here's what it'd have been. And do, so at least use that. Do you do that at the publication level to like Forbes in order Typically to get? Typically not. Okay. We, we don't have clients that are like asking for that. And I think if you're dealing with clients, that are getting that nitty gritty with with well, what was the cost of it? Ooh, that's it's probably cost, maybe not. I a, think in our industry, I think it's like great. Lady Gaga tweeted about us, but mm -hmm. what does that mean? And I think there could be it's just a matter of what story you're going to tell based on mm -hmm. what that actually means. Mm -hmm. And I think we run into that, but it's like um, you know we do events where you know we'll have Shaq come into one of our activations or our booth, mm -hmm. and he'll hey, let me get that man. That's dope. I want to tweet mm -hmm. that. Well. That's yeah. incredible. But, and then if the, the next year the client's like, yeah, we just don't know if we have budget for the activation this year. I'm just like, uh, yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. But that's, now, that's the problem I think a lot of people have. What I will say though is when you have a volume mm -hmm. of things to show to a client, when we have 30 press placements over the course of an engagement with them. You have to put a, them, a round number on it, right? Well, well, now we're not nitpicking one thing. They're not going to say like, well, jump. Lady Gaga was only this effective. It's because, well, let, let's look at the aggregate of it because branding is also an aggregate artist game in right. a sense. It's not usually just a one-time thing that triggers the consumer to act in such a way. Yep. It, it is an aggregate play. So you could hopefully stand to the body of your work and point to the body and say, well, this mass of content coverage, et cetera, has produced and put you this far ahead from, let's say, these five competitors that you have. So we look at much more on the aggregate sense. That's interesting. Because it's not a one-hit wonder type yeah, the, of thing. That, the reason I asked that question, and I may be going down a rabbit hole, but um, we work so much in the event space, yes. Super Bowl, iHeartRadio Awards, like these different things that it's like, okay, how do we do? And now it's over. Mm -hmm. So here, instead of like a long-term play. Yeah. So I think it's like, how did we activate it? How do we capitalize on the moment? Mm. And what did that mean? And I think that's the question. Anybody that works in kind of the event or sports yeah, where it's a big hard. game. Yeah. That's a hard time. Yep. Yeah. So you have to do the aggregate. Um, so I want to get your thoughts just overall on the industry as a whole about PR blunders. We see what oh, we you talked about there's Pepsi. So many. We talked about there's Pepsi, so many. but Kendall Jenner's Pepsi ad yeah. went over very, very we were poorly. We were talking about that actually. Yeah. yeah. We were talking about it on the um, car right up here. United Airlines and oh, removing yeah. the passenger. So I'm sure you've dealt with crisis mm -hmm. or at least risk mm -hmm. management when it's come mm -hmm. to your clients. And what's your overall philosophy mm -hmm. when you have to deal with situations like that? First thing is, especially for these tech companies, a crisis can happen any time. Oh, we only have five employees. We don't care. 
oh, we only have 50 employees. We don't care because anything can be blown up, especially right now. There's a lot of naysayers of Silicon Valley and yeah. such. Silicon Valley is not this lovely castle in the sky type of thing glowing. Mm-hmm. No, a lot of people are poking holes through all that yeah. stuff. So you are never too small to have a plan in okay. place in case an employee goes off the rails or in pl- case there's something with the co-founder or in case you're getting something involved with the investor who happens to... It, 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 there's, there's so many cases. So just always, it doesn't matter your size or the amount of funding or your amount of revenue or whatever, have a plan in place. That's the best thing. That's the best thing. And you mentioned employees. You mean employees just getting fired and then going out the rails saying oh, we they're see this terrible. All the time. Interesting. Oh, I was sexually harassed. Oh, I was unfairly paid. Well, look at Uber. Hey. Oh, I was... Yeah, Microsoft yeah. is dealing with a class action suit for mm. i read it today 8416 women trying to get 20 something 1 million for all the i mean yeah. huge yeah. pr issue 8000 people i mean yeah. that just the organiz- how to organize that mass of people i'm like wow i mean what did that take that's phenomenal but now that's a huge crisis for and if you're met with that challenge it might be like yeah we're probably going to good luck uh, that's i mean that's tough that's that's, that's the hugely, toughest that that's the worst obviously most companies are not microsoft level but the point is you can always have a problem. You can always have a problem. So just have a plan that's ready to go. So there's no flailing. There's no... So you get down to the granular level of if an employee leaves the company and says that the company steals IP and they're terrible yep. people, here's the PR plan that we then enact if that happens. Usually it's a bit broader okay. because there's so many implications of what could possibly happen that it's more of a here are the steps of the crisis that we are going to follow and in what time frame. So it's very clear that if this happens here in the nev- the next 72 hours is what's going to happen because well, quickness pays. You need to be let's on Let's use on House of Cards and Netflix as an example. So the Kevin Spacey news yeah. comes out. Yep. And pretty quickly they say that um, this is their last season mm-hmm. was the first thing they said. Mm-hmm. But anybody that knew House of Cards knew that was already uh, yeah. their last season. But it, I think it was kind of a smart PR thing because people around the water cooler were like, yeah, they, they, they made the, this season the last one. Then it went to, we're suspending Kevin Spacey. Then it went to, he's off the show. Yeah. Um, but what is your first course of action? I know this is like a loaded question, but mm-hmm. when something bad happens with your brand, do you attack it and answer it right away? Is that the number one mm-hmm. philosophy? Mm-hmm. Do you stay away for a little bit? Do you try to make a new story to combat the the bad story? What's your There's philosophy? There's so many people who botch this, and I would say number one thing is you address it. You address, address it immediately. It. Address it immediately. We are aware of the situation involving X. We are working on the solution. It. We are looking into it, et cetera. Okay. Not addressing it creates speculation, hugely. Because now people are going to fill in the gaps. Yeah. And they're going to also talk about like, oh, they're not acting on this. They're not doing this. So you need to just raise the flag to say, we are aware. Yes. Okay. We are working on it. And here, if there's a certain time frame tied to it, this is when we will respond. Then you can get into the response once you have aggregated the information pertaining to the situation. Because usually the reason companies hold off in saying anything is because they're going, well, we don't know all the information. We don't know all the information. But meanwhile, everyone else is trying to fill yeah. in their information. So say you and now they're the speculating. And now there's a witch hunt going. And now all this thing. So placate that by saying, we are aware and we are aggregating the information, the accusations, mm-hmm. the da, 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 da. That's the best way to just say, keep yourself accountable and honest with we are aware and we're working on it and then you can come out with the full statement once you know all the key elements ignoring is the worst thing the worst thing because people will fill in the gaps and now in today's social media world they will immediately fill in the gaps within less you know hours this is what we see all the time with the feedback loop now is tremendous you don't have a news cycle of a day you have literally minutes it is true and what, what's your first platform to go to in those situations? Depends on the client. Okay. Depends on the audience. If they're active on Twitter, it could be on it could be on Twitter. Maybe it's something more. Maybe you need to email people because it could be maybe an internal problem that's brewing, okay. and you need to think of your internal yep. audiences. Maybe your investors, your employees, something like that. It does depend. But in that PR plan, you will have a delineation of here are the six audiences we hmm. need to communicate, and in which way. In which way, in which platform? What's your philosophy on um, continuing business as usual in terms of, you know, if a big crisis like that happens and, mm-hmm. and you come out and say, we're looking into it, do you also recommend you need to stop marketing? You need to stop doing some of those rollouts because mm-hmm. you need to focus on this. And I think what happens is 
if Jeremy Piven uh, in his situation gets accused of sexual assault, whether he's guilty or not, he says, I come out, I did not do it. Should he really be on Ellen the next day talking about his new movie? Probably yeah. not. So I think, yeah. do you very shut situational. down situational? It is situational. Because there's going to be times where it's just, it's not appropriate. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But if you're Procter & Gamble, you got to keep, yeah, keep running on, on all those Still. products. So it really depends. It really depends. Usually when you see an individual being accused, they do get rid of, or frankly, they're disinvited. The producers come and say like, you're not going to be on this. We're not going to have you. We're going to ditch you on this, this, and this. Much better if you proactively come out and say, you know what? For the next two weeks, I've I've decided to not be on any shows or engagements because now you at least control that message. Yeah. Even if they were going to call you up in two minutes and say, hey, guess what? You're not getting booked. But at least you can come out with that and, and see, save a little face with that. And I know this is, again, I know you don't know PR for individuals in terms of like Hollywood, but like I'm just thinking like the Louis C.K. situation. Yeah. He's not Harvey Weinstein. He did some um, despicable things, mm -hmm. but um, he obviously wasn't accused of actual sexual assault. It was just very inappropriate behavior. In my opinion, you need to just go away for a while, one or two years, three, three years potentially, where nobody just hears from you. Then maybe there's a potential possibility, or maybe do you think someone like that, his career is over and he can he didn't never come back from it? I don't think careers can necessarily be ended. Again, it's the severity, of course. Unless you're Harvey Weinstein, I think he's... Yeah, that's yeah. pretty done. That's pretty done. People love comebacks, yeah. though. People, We all make mistakes Michael and Vick. such apologies can be made yeah. and people forget that's the other aspect so take some time mm -hmm. away depending on the severity and then you can re-enter and, and do something else monica Lewinsky did this great she did a ted talk about just you know coming back from that you know, that horrible thing being the intern that got hit on by mm -hmm. the president all that yeah, you know. yeah right. but yeah you can come back but you need to be appropriate with the time in which to come back. So personal brands, like when something happens, you, you make your statement and then mm -hmm. you need to go into a corner for a while. And yeah. yeah. Take some time. Yeah. Look at Martha Stewart. Yeah, it's true too. Talking about Snoop Dogg. There yeah, you go. See their really, butts. Really example. Um, so PR releases in the digital age, again, going back kind of old school PR, the PR releases were a big part hmm. of uh, PR to get that positive brand awareness, but it really was the email um, or the letter back in the day to kind of launch that new brand or talk about that new mm -hmm. celebrity endorsement. Um, with this new digital space now in social, how has that changed in terms of getting mm -hmm. the word out there? Because I'm assuming some things just need a 140 character tweet rather That's than right. sending an email out to your entire database. That's true. Yeah. Very much so. So sometimes you don't need a press release. It's, it's just, it, I relate to it as, it's like the prescription the doctor fills out. That little piece of paper, it's kind of frivolous in a way, mm -hmm. but it gets you something. All a press release is, is a complete compilation of all the details pertaining to a certain thing with some quotes and a format and a thing like that. It's formal. It's yeah. formal. But people who expect for anything to happen because you release it on the web and you're going to wait and get all this media coverage. No, absolutely not. There are, there are so many press releases put on these distribution sites. Yeah. It's just an SEO play. That's just an SEO play. Get, get some links back. You'll be on Yahoo Finance or whatever. But that's all it is. It's just a document with all the relevant details. What you really need to do is you need to have your press team, your PR team, be pitching the story okay. to get the actual organic earned content or coverage. That's it. Or your Google you just post something on your blog and, and everyone you know and their mother covers you because Apple, yeah. there are reporters at certain outlets that's only job is to follow Alpha, uh, Alphabet. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. But those are for the few. So, but how has that changed since 06? Because I'm assuming that used to be more of your day-to-day -day and what you guys yeah. did and now it's not. Eh, eh. Yeah. I mean, we would never, you never, and there's, this still happens, but you would never just, just do BCC it. an email, put all your press contacts in there with the copy and paste of a press release. Why yeah. would you ever do that? That's that is not no. You should be fired if you're at a firm doing that because that's just the pray and spray type of, of thing. Uh, that's not effective. You want to get a piece of coverage. You're going to individually contact your media contacts, pit, plate up a perfect story of a perfect angle for them that pertains to their audience, and do it that way. 
And are you going, is that all with your team? Um, is it very one-to-one? It is. And that's, how, that's, that's changed a little bit too. Cause I think it really, what you should be that spraying, not everybody obviously, but yeah. Hey, send it out to these 20 media outlets. Hey, I have a great story for you, but now mm-hmm. I'm seeming it's probably those relationship based. Oh, it's all relationship like, based. Like, Hey, what's going on? I hope the kids are going well. I thought you guys might exactly. like this story. Here's a quick synopsis. Exactly. This is why we do events with them. We have dinners with them. Mm-hmm. We take them out karaoke. We go to drinks. They're people. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like you were talking with another human. So it, it pays to know and have the relationship with them. Because then also if you have a relationship, you can call on that favor every once in a while. You could say, hey, I know this isn't exactly what you would do, but could you send it to so-and-so who I don't know who might be able to write about it? Because you're going to need those favors in PR. But those favors are not going to be granted if you have no relationship. Yeah. You need to have the relationship. So being in San Francisco, being in New York, being in the major metropolitans where the media lives is important so that you can see them face to face. Face to face is always the best. Yeah. And I think that's uh, for any business. uh, I mean, it's really all about the relationships, right? So, I mean, if you're able to make those relationships with those, with those media outlets, they're going to trust you and know. Mm -hmm. And I think if something isn't valuable and you you know, it's all one sided, like Mm -hmm. I need to get this in, then that's when you say, I'm I'm just not even going to waste that touch on that type of moment. The thing is, I mean, despite all the data and all the analytics and all the things that are out there, business is about Mm -hmm. relationships. Humans are still building And I think a lot of people forget that. They do. They they don't even know that. So we need to remember, real people, humans, work in businesses. Businesses are still about, and probably for a very long time, will be about relationships. And they're busy, and they just got chewed up by their boss, and things happen. And it, we're dealing with humans yeah, here. Yeah, it's just how it how it's how it is. And I don't really care what space your business is is in. If it's super B two B, you are still selling ultimately to a human. You are. Yeah. There's that decision maker or that contract or that media person. It's still a human. So yeah. you need to have a relationship until we're selling, you know, bots are selling or pitching bots, <laughs> which I think we're very long away from. Yeah. You, this is it, business is about relationships. So where do we, and that's how business gets done. Yeah. Where do we go from here? So we look five, 10 years down the road. I mean, in my opinion, I think when you look at voice, you look at Alexa and mm-hmm. you look at what Facebook and Instagram is doing and everybody's on their phone. I mean, everybody. Oh yeah, of course. And our, For now. our attention spans are getting shorter. So the reason I, I talked about press releases is if you're trying to get in front of a certain market, I think even to a certain point, you look at a Forbes or an Inc, which um, has been so fruitful, I'm sure for your clients in the past, how many people are reading that 19 paragraph mm-hmm. article about that mm-hmm. and how can it be more bite-sized? I even think for me now, when I watch a video, I'm constantly tapping it to see how much is left of the video. Um, so I think the 15 second videos are now part of like how to get in front of people. So mm-hmm. where do you think in, in PR specifically and getting brand awareness out there, where mm-hmm. do you think we're going with this? I think there is still a slight backlash that is brewing Okay, that is going towards more longer form. That is going for the in-depth. It seems that the pendulum Especially always swings back and oh, forth. Yeah. It's always swinging. Yep. It's always swinging. And I and I definitely feel, especially in journalism right now, that is having a huge crescendo of a moment because of the Trump stuff and everything mm-hmm. and fake news. You're seeing those long form articles and there's apps and such that are now the long form. It's and true. like you listen to a Tim Ferriss podcast, that thing's an hour and 40 minutes. So there, I, I think there's a pendulum swim to more detail mm-hmm. and getting more in depth with stuff. I think there will always be the 10 second little blips and the videos and things like that and the little bite sized stuff. But for the consumer that wants the in depth and wants to really understand something, there is going to be a space for the long form. I think it's just a pendulum that's yeah. always swinging. Maybe the pendulum gets kicked a little bit more. So we're going to see bigger swings. But that's just the nature the, the, of where we're in. The best example that I think is uh, back like when I graduated uh, or when I was in college, like uh, what was it, 06 to 09-ish, um, everybody, when they would go on a trip, spring break, yeah. they would upload their entire photo album to Facebook, hundreds of photos, um, and make that publicly available to anybody uh-huh. and everybody. Then we went to Snapchat where mm-hmm. everything gets deleted after mm-hmm. 24 hours. So talk about pendulum. Like I'm going to share with you my entire life and now I'm only a gonna, little bit. Yeah. And now I'm only going to show you, you can't even see it after 24 hours uh-huh. and it's gone forever. Uh-huh. So from a social media standpoint, we've seen that pendulum um, and, and, and how we've gone from, let me share a whole paragraph of how my day is going to now. Let me share a, a small sentence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to, I think overall businesses and, and you as a consultant, if you were to come in and say, 
you're a small business, you don't do anything when it comes to PR. What's the first step you think people can take before maybe they enter a relationship with a band communications or spend five, mm-hmm. 10, 20 grand a month? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is the one thing that, that businesses or brands are doing wrong and need to think about today when yeah. it comes to their brand? So we talk about this at these PR boot camps that we lead for mm-hmm. smaller companies that are of course not gonna pay us anytime right, soon necessarily right. for this. And so when I tell folks, whether they're the head of marketing or it's even the founder themselves, the business owner is, okay, you can start work- making your own relationships right now. And so what does that look like in terms of that? Well, you don't go up to someone and say, oh my gosh, you wanna write a whole story about me? No, if you don't know them, that, that you seem like a weirdo. And yeah. that's not gonna be well taken. So. Start slowly. Pick out 20 outlets, maybe it's 10, that are the ones you want to be Your influence in your industry. Then go, who writes for those? Who are the people there? Email such Mm. people. Maybe you're in New York City. Great, go meet them for coffee. Hey, I'm in the space. You're not asking for something to write about me right now and how great we are. Don't make the ask right off the bat. You don't know these people. (laughs) That's not going to go over well, typically, unless you are so amazing and there's something to talk about. But typically, spend the six months to a year building, building, building your own relationship with all these different outlets, such that when you need the favor of like, oh, hey, we're about to launch or we got this big thing, you can hit up your people and say, hey, I've got something for you because you have a relationship and you've spent the time and the investment in making them relationship, which means you are also giving to them. You are giving them a source. You are saying, hey, saw your article on this and I shared it. Or you know, you are helping them. That's how you build a relationship. It's not all about just give me, just give me everything I want. That's a transactional is that a system, situation. Is that a major problem in your industry? That's where, a problem. Like yeah. the majority of people are just asking for favors and not building those yeah. relationships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that, is that why you think you're, you and your company can be, is that your unique qualifier that makes you different? That's one of them. That's okay. one of them. The way you can get away with uh, kind of the, the, the favor or just like the coverage out the bat is if you have a fantastic client doing a fantastic yeah, thing yeah. that is so perfect of a fit for this writer yeah. that they go, oh, that's exactly what I want to hear about. You provided value to that person. Exactly. Though, right? Maybe you plated it up so that you gave them you know, the two quotes and the expert and the story and the data and you can like plate it up. So there's that. But how many situations do you get like that? Hmm, maybe less than you'd like. So if you have a relationship, you're going to be able to maybe get feedback from them. We just are doing this with the client right now. And so we're, our contacts are coming back and saying, hey, you know, no, I'm not interested, but here's why. Because I would rather, I need this and this. Hmm. Hey, I need I need that element and this. And I, I then I could get it. Then we can give that back to the client and say, hey, there's not enough meat in this piece right now. But if we played it up A and B, we can go back to them. So that's what relationships will also tell you is, what would be sellable. Right. They want to help you. Exactly. Instead of just no response. Interesting. And you'll get no response if you have no relationship. And what have you seen to be the most efficient? Because I'm assuming with these relationships, you want to make their life as easy as possible. So not only are you giving them a great story that they would really geek out over and Mm -hmm. dig, but I'm sure you're doing a lot of the legwork. Like here's the breakdown, bullet point by bullet point of all the facts and all the things that you may find interesting. Um, I'm just interested in how you package that up oh, yeah. and, and how you make their life easier. You do not send a 17 paragraph pitch. These are some of the busiest people there are. And they're checking on their phone too, so they can they're only scroll on so much. They're checking on their phone, they're doing all this stuff. We actually have a, a startup that I won't mention here, but yeah. is solving part of this with a, which a, like a, pit, a pitch platform where they're getting curated content to their inbox because this is a big problem. There's, there's, they're inundated with all these email pitches. Typically, email is the number one source that they use, yep. over 80%, 90% even in some research and estimates. That they're, that they're receiving pitches. So it needs to be short and sweet and well-packaged bullet points, no more than 10 sentences. Is that still like 100% <laughs> of your outreach with your relationships is still email or? Not 100, because still the in-persons help. Okay. Some of them even prefer, they'll do DMs. You know, they'll do that. That's interesting. They do do that. So you might say like, here's a link out to more information mm-hmm. and you kind of you package might. that up for mm-hmm. them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're friends with them on Facebook, something like that, or on Instagram or whatever. So there's there's that. If you have a relationship, that's going to be I was thinking of you. Case. I think this would be super yeah. interesting for your publication. Saw your photo of your dog, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. That stuff works. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so when you, when you do actually package this stuff up, I mean, um, and this may be an ignorant question, but you're not writing the article for said person. You're just giving mm-hmm. them, that's probably a big like, no, no, it's like you're not going to no, no. write it for them. No, no. But 
Um, Unless it's a byline content, which they play. So you'll see okay. sometimes contributed content on certain tech outlets, let's say. But you need to know if they accept contributed content or byline content. Otherwise, you're plating up the information such that they can go, great, now I'm going to go write that story. Or great, I want to talk to those three people. Set me up. Something like and how, that. And how can you set it up? Like, is it just a basic who, what, when, where, why with bullet points that are super easy to read and keep it under a sentence so they get the the deal of the story yeah. or like, I'm just, I guess I'm more fascinated with how you, um, the, the recipe that works the best mm -hmm. for your different, different relationships. It all kind of depends because they're all different, but terseness is best because then they can respond and say, Oh, I want to have more information or, Oh, I want to get on a call with the founder or something. Interesting. So ask so, before you say, here's all the stuff you want to know. Oh, never just give them gotcha. all of it. Gotcha. No. Now, some though that you will then talk to are like if you don't send me everything then it, then it, it Everybody's depends. A bit so it helps to know. But that's a what good answer. It depends. Yeah. It, yeah. it helps to know. But brevity is usually the better course. There's there, there's never a one size fits all approach. No, there's one. not because you're dealing with humans. Back to humans. Yeah, you're dealing yeah. with humans who that. all have preferences. Um, I want to get um, just a, a little personal too. So born and raised sure. in SD, I think yeah. you, you said you were you've been to more than sixty countries. Yeah, um, I think it's more at this. Point. How has that shaped kind of your storytelling and the narratives that you tell, and maybe your relationships with your clients mm -hmm. or your relationships with people on the, on the media side? I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you feel like that's that's shaped you in, in a certain way. It re it defines for me that storytelling is universal. It is all across humanity. We've been telling stories as long as we've been mm -hmm. around fires. So that's never going away. How we tell stories, of course, will change. This is a form of storytelling. Right. Twitter is a form of storytelling. Media, so th I'm, it's going to change and evolve. But as a human component, it's never going to go away. And I think with the more places I go to, you yet again find that this is true. We all tell stories. We tell stories to the younger generations. Yeah. We tell stories amongst each other. We share in a way that's storytelling. So this is a absolutely human kind thing yep you, you cannot escape that so that's what it reminds me of that and then i think secondly that for clients and we have a number of international clients yeah there are some things and cultural norms that different countries happen to have there's a tech norm too the silicon valley type of norm yeah. so you, you you start to realize that yes there there are differences amongst all different types of people and businesses and such that you should pay attention to if you want this to work. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good reminder too of like there are customs and norms that every type of culture, whether that be an ethnic one or a, a or a business one, pertain to. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that I think this uh, my industry when it comes to social entertainment sports, there's a little bit of a freak out mode because of the mm. transition from linear to OTT. Mm -hmm. um, and and what I always kind of go back to is there was a time where everybody got their information and stories yeah. from radio. Yeah. And there was this new evolution or mm -hmm. this revolution of the television. Mm -hmm. And that became what everybody uh, used. Now we're just going through a different revolution, which oh, yeah. is the mobile device yeah. um, and using our platforms and using Google Home and all these different mm -hmm. things. But the content doesn't change. The storytelling doesn't really change. No. It's just a different platform. It's just all different. So platforms. email is different. You used to maybe fax somebody a PPR story or you would write a, This is a, what I've heard. Letter. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's, you're still doing the same storytelling, the same type of business relationships. It just We're using different platforms. And there's going to be mm -hmm. a lot of different ones in 20 oh, years yeah. too, but we're going to still probably use the same, same philosophies. We'll still be telling stories. Well, I love it. Well, tell us more about how people can find out more about you and, and what you're currently working sure. on. Sure. So yep. our... PR firm's website is BAM Communications with an S on the end, dot biz, B I Z. And then my personal website is beckbamberger.com. I really appreciate it. This has been a fascinating conversation. I'm sure we'll have more over. Thanks, over. Dave. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks so much. Thanks for being. All right. So there was Beck Bamberger. Uh, she's the founder of BAM Communications. And I think the conversation uh, was super helpful. I mean, I really do think uh, most of our listeners and talking about the business of social and sports and entertainment, uh, the, the main question is earned media value. And also with all the different events and different things that are going on uh, with your brand, how are you able to leverage that with positive PR? And I really like what she said at the end of the day. All the questions really came back to relationships. If you're always asking, asking, asking for favors and trying to flood people kind of the – 
the spray and pray approach, it's not going to work. So finding ways to have a plan, not only for, for what we talked a little bit about there, crisis aversion and risk management, but also when it comes to all the great things you're doing that to get more positive awareness out of there. Because at the end of the day, it builds more credibility uh, and it's not you just talking about yourself and being in sales mode. It's really others talking about you in a positive light. So thought the conversation was, was super interesting. We really want to always provide value when it comes to the business of social. We'll see you next episode.